We were going to have Jim give us a solo today, but he, he opted not to sit down there. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> So, what do you mean by that? I mean, am I might leave after the first. <laughs> 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 All right. So, we want to pray today for Ricky, who's in the hospital. And we want to pray for Lonnie's wife, Roxanne. She's got some serious lung issues going on in her. Amen. 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 Amen.
Well, as far as the east point, the east and the west, they never come back together again. He forgets your sins. He forgives your sins. He washes you clean. I remember when I gave my life to Jesus, I had felt seriously, literally, like a weight was lifted off my life. I prayed for people before. My, old, my brother Joe, I prayed for him years ago at the Red Lion to accept Jesus. It was in one of the hotel rooms, I remember. When I prayed for him, we prayed together and he received Jesus. He said, I feel like a thousand pounds has been lifted off my chest because God he washed him. He cleansed him. And so that's good news. That's why you can have such joy. I can go through life knowing God doesn't have anything against me. He's not mad at me. Yeah, you can say, well, what about this, that, and the other thing? I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And now, when you become a Christian, you are in Christ. We're going to find out in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ, you're not condemned. Do you still make mistakes? Yes. But then it is sin in you. It is the, the sinful nature. But you are in Christ Jesus. When God looks to you, I love this analogy. I do it because I think it, it points a picture. Everybody who's saved is, is born again. You're in Christ. We're in Christ. We're in the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. So, when you are in sin before you surrendered your life to Jesus, if this little alcohol swab was Steve and my eyes were God's eyes and I'm looking at it, who do I see? Steve. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word and the Word is with God and the Word was God. So this is Jesus, the Word. So when I became a Christian, I gave my heart to Christ. And actually, I just believed Him. He already had once I believed Him. Then I'm in Christ Jesus. Now, when Father looks at Steve, who does he see? Jesus. That's the awesome thing. And just because you make mistakes doesn't mean you're going to be jumping out of Jesus. That's what people do. Oh, I blew it again. Now I'm out of Christ. No, you're not. That's just your sin nature battling against you. There's a growth process. That's the thing people don't understand. And that will come along and say, Oh, you never got saved. God's mad at you. You better you quit going to church. It's all phony anyway. That's what the devil says. But it's, he's the one who's phony. Because he knows that Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the sin. From the curse of the law. And so, you don't have to beat yourself up. I still do things I wish I wouldn't do. You know, I, I'm Irish. I don't know if that really means anything, but I, I am Irish. And I have a temper. So it might mean something. So sometimes I'll do things and I'll say, oh man, I wish I would just, I wish God would just cool this head. But he has a lot. If you ask my brother and sister, when I was a kid, I had such a hot head. I was a terrible hot head. I could cuss the wallpaper off the walls and I'd slap you around just for looking at me wrong. I did. I had a terrible temper. So God has, and here's the thing. So it's that sin nature that what gets riled up once in a while. But he's changing me from glory to glory. I'm not the man I was 35 years ago. And I hope next week I'm not the man I am today. We're supposed to be growing in Christ, transformed from glory to glory. As you yield to the Holy Spirit in your life, he changes you. So for me to tell you that when you come to Jesus, your sins are forgiven you, that's great news. And so if you go out, now here's the thing. When you really come to Jesus, He's come to your life. He's, he's come and he's, he's going to change you. He'll accept you as you are. He'll take your drug addicted, alcohol addicted, sin, lying, cheating, stealing the bodies, and He'll forgive you. And then He'll begin to make changes from the inside out. He changes your heart first. When he'll start showing you the things that you used to do, they offend him. There are things I remember when I first got saved. If I slept, like one time I think I told you guys I was at the Red Lion Hotel when I got saved, and one time I was running for an elevator, and I'd only been saved for about two weeks, and I was wearing dress shoes because we had to dress up as a waiter and in this fine dining restaurant, and I slid, I couldn't stop, and I hit my knee on this cement wall, and I swore, I swore, I used the name of the Lord in vain. Loud. And immediately, my heart convicted me. I felt awful that I, and I, all the way up from the ground floor to the 18th floor, I said, Lord, please forgive me. I don't ever want to cuss. I don't ever want to take your name in vain. Put a guard on this big mouth of mine. Purify my mouth. Purify my heart. And he does. He has been. Got a long way to go.
but he's working it out. So that's the good news. Your sins are forgiving you. Man, that's that's what you got to know. Okay. Get me going. I could just stop there and we could be done. Verse 9. Now is this blessing only for the Jews or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous uh, by God through faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after circumcised, circumcised or before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Okay, why is this important? Because circumcision is a sign made in the flesh that you were a child of Abraham, a follower of Abraham. But before the the sign of the flesh was made, he was already it was already credited to him as righteousness. So it's not something you do physically. You know, some people, some Christians would much rather sacrifice than they would to obey. Some of us would rather go and do things for God and go do a food drive or do something like they feel good about themselves, but then they want to stay in their sin. God said to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey daily, walk with God. Why do I, God, why do I want to obey God? Because I love God. Because He has forgiven me of my sins. He saved my life. My life is no longer my own. My life was heaven for hell. I had a bunk reserved for me. And Jesus changed my reservation from hotel hell to hotel heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And I have a I have a mansion in heaven. So do you if you could, if you're a Christian, Jesus has changed your life. So I love him so much. I want to live for him. I want to obey him. It's an honor to obey him. I'm not gonna be uh, I don't want to be a religious as well. I'm more obedient than you are, like some Christians do. And that's not what it's all about. It's about your personal walk with Jesus. Amen. It's about you really knowing what God has done for you. And from that, your life is changed. Everything's changed. So, let's go down here to verse 18. Even there, even when there was no hope, Abraham kept hoping. I like this believing that God, that he would become the father of many nations. So God told Abraham when he first encountered him that he would be, I'm losing this mic, he would be the father of many nations. Now Abraham's 100 years old. Now be the father of nations, that means you've got to sire children. At least a child. He's 100 years old. And so here it's saying here that even though he was old, Abraham believed God. He said in verse 19, and that Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though he was about 100 years old, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. But Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger in this, that he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit, it was recorded for our benefit also. Assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we believe in Him. And the one who died on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, He has handed Him who was handed over because of our sins and raised to life to make us right with God. Here's the good news. When you come to Jesus Christ, suddenly you are made right with God. Your sins are forgiven. Because before you're born again, you're not right with God. You have no peace with God. You are at enmity with God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you can say, well, I have faith. But if you're not born again, faith, you all have faith. Nobody's running out of the building thinking the building's going to fall on them. You've got a certain amount of faith. But it has to be saving faith in Jesus Christ. That saves you. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that God sent him into the world to die for our sins. And we, we accept that faith. We accept that by faith and we are saved. Let's go to verse chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Bing! I have peace with God. Not because of anything I did, but because of what Jesus did. That's the difference between being really saved and trying to be saved by works. There are, in the system of religion I was raised in, 
you, they believe that you're saved because you do sacraments and you do certain things. In reality, the Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of works, it's a gift of God. Let's get any man should boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. So, we, it takes everything off of us. We can't boast because we're just as wretched and just in need of salvation as everybody else. And all we can do is say in the face, keep the sound. Uh oh. Yeah, but is that heaven? I must be speaking in different tongues up here. Did, did I say turn your telephones off or just say forget them in your phone? Oh, it happens every week. I expect it, as a matter of fact. One of these days, we're going to get a phone call, and I'm going to hear a deep voice saying, Stephen. And then we all better listen. No. No, he's on that phone right now, and this is his message. Verse, verse 3. Hallelujah. No, verse 2. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved favor where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in the glory of God. Because of faith, God has given us grace to know that the day is going to come when our faith will someday be made sight. Someday when all this is over and you're standing before the Lord, everything I've been preaching to you guys, you're going to see it face to face. And it's because of God's grace that you can have that hope. I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I don't just hope. I don't have my fingers crossed. I don't you know, burn 14 candles every day to hope I can, you know. No, God says so. And so I take him at his word. God said, he that believes in me shall have eternal life. I believe in God. I don't just believe He's up there, but I have saving faith. I believe He died for my sins. I believe that He loved me so much that He died on the cross. All of my wickedness went up on the cross with all those other sins. Pride, lust, gossip, gluttony, drug use, murder, porn, hate, abortion, adultery, idolatry, sinfulness, selfishness, divorce, rage, greed, all these things, drunkenness, envy, strife, but he won't on the cross wasn't big enough to get them all on there. But Jesus Christ paid for all our sins on the cross. And that's why I have joy. So you can't steal my joy. If someday my body gets sick and the Lord chooses to use that as a vehicle to take me into glory, that's just going to be the way it's going to go. I, I think me and him have a deal going though. I do so many hospital calls. One day I was having like five hospital calls and uh, I was walking down to the old St. Joe's and I said, Lord, how about this? How about when you take me, you just get me out of here. Take me. Just let me drop over and go home. I don't want to go it's wallowing in a hospital. I've been here all the time. But, and so I think we have a deal. But you, know, you, you tell me when we get to heaven how it works out. But however, if, if, if it's disease, if it's a car accident, if it's your heart stuck, whatever, it's just a vehicle to take you into heaven. When a Christian dies, it's not a time to be sad for them. I mean, it's sad for us because we're going to miss them, but for them, man, go be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Uh, David Mendoza, where's our brother David? Precious man of God. His mom just died, and uh, he brought me today a picture because she's down there in Mexico, and uh, she was in her casket, and he's just smiling. She's an heaven. She's an heaven. Jim and I, knew, I love him. We just dearly, years ago, he loved the Lord. Every time he started talking about Jesus, he'd get tears running down his face. And uh, when he got sick, uh, his pastor came to see him, and Daryl says to his pastor, Doc Pastor, the doctor told me I only have three weeks to live. Are you jealous? And he meant that he was smiling. <laughs> he couldn't wait to go be with Jesus. Why? Because he believed that this is just, this, this life is temporary. And at best, it's not great. Life's hard. It's tough. But Jesus has made a promise for us that someday we'll be with him where there'll be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more tears. We can rejoice, too, verse 3, chapter 5, when we run into problems and trials 
For we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Have you ever seen a, a father with a child, or a grandpa with a granddaughter, or a mother with a child? It's just a, some, that special connection and that love between them. Maybe you didn't have that with your father or your grandfather, and that's disappointing. But I want you to realize that God the Father loves you with an unspeakable love and a joy when you come home to be his child. I can't even describe it. I don't have I don't know. He loves you that much. Somebody said, man, nobody loves me. God loves you. Even if everybody else doesn't love you, God loves you. And if everybody else does, God loves you, you're all right. He's the only one who's got the keys. He's got my room reserved. And I'm going to see him face to face and so will you if you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for sinners. Right on time. God's right on time. Now most people would be willing to die for a person who, if they were upright. Though some might perhaps be willing to die for a good person. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While you were out there and while I was out there in the world doing all the wicked things that I was doing, thinking I was, I was big and bad enough to do, Christ was loving me. The Holy Spirit was wooing me. He's the one that was pulling on your heart all those years when you were in the street. He's the one that was telling you, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But we did that. And then, but he's the one who's always saying, like some of you guys, I've had people come in here and say, you know, I was just walking by and something to walk in. There was a guy one time who came in just for a cup. Jerry, put me on this mic here, will you? Sarah's mic. This thing keeps going out. Go with it. So the guy walks in for a cup of coffee. He got saved. And heaven became his destiny. Because he just came in. Who led him in here? It was the Holy Spirit. Who drew him in here? The Bible says no one comes to the Father except they've been drawn. So the Holy Spirit's been drawn, some of you guys, for a long time. And you just keep pushing him back, pushing him back, pushing him back. Stop pushing against the Lord. Amen. He's, he's drawing you because he wants to lavish love on you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to heal you. He wants to make you a child of God. He wants to change your, your situation from sadness to singing. He wants to change your lamentation into laughter. Only God can do that. So it's the Holy Spirit. He's saying that to you now. Come to me. God loves you. Hallelujah. I just love the Lord so much. Let me see if I'm going to finish here. Yeah, going down here to uh, still in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone because Adam was the father of everybody. Everybody in his line had that sin nature. It was just passed to everybody born. Everybody except for one, Jesus. Because his dad did not have man's DNA. The Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. There was no DNA that would match his on this earth because it had to be precious blood. Only precious blood would have been accepted for the sacrifice for our sins. So Adam's sin brought death to everyone. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because they were not yet, there was no law yet to break. Still everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not obey the explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a difference, a great difference between Adam's sin and God's grace. For the sin of one man, Adam brought death to everybody. But even greater is God's grace 
and his gift of forgiveness to many through the other man, Jesus Christ. And as the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of man's sin, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you continue to live in sin and you reject the offer of heaven, if you reject Christ's offer of love and salvation, your wages will be paid in full when you die. If you accept the mercy and grace of God, the grace of God is going to be realized. It be, it's realized now. Some of you guys are reaping for your sins now. What you sow, you'll reap. Some of you say, what's wrong? I don't understand what's wrong. Repent. Give your life to Jesus. Come to your senses. Watch, start living fruits of righteousness and watch God change your situation. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's grace leads to our being made right with God, even though we are as guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but God's grace, His wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God for every new Christian. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. Because one other person obeyed God, many became righteous. So if you're not in Christ Jesus today, you're in Adam. If you are in Christ Jesus today, you're in Christ. There's only two places. You're in Adam or you're in Christ. The question is, which are you? And the truth is, God knows. You might fool me every time. You're never going to fool God. You're never going to fool God. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. So I'm just going to finish this chapter. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But people sinned more and more. God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I, because of grace, am standing in righteousness with God. The Bible says he, he, put, he wraps you in the robe of Christ's righteousness. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. But my sin, I died to sin with Christ. So did you. If you became a Christian, you've died to sin. Your flesh still wages war against the Spirit. That sin nature still battles against the new nature, but it's no longer me because I'm in Christ and I'm no longer condemned. Hallelujah. I mean, man, everybody in this place ought to be saying, oh God, I want that. Because one thing I know for sure, we all got a date with God, every one of us. And whether you spend it in in heaven or hell depends totally on the decision you make about who Jesus Christ is while you are alive. People have come. I've had people call me and say, Pastor Steve, would you preach this funeral? Someone in my family's died. Would you preach the funeral? I know if you preach it, some no, no, no. <laughs> Someone's not going to go to heaven because this knucklehead preaches at the funeral. The only way anybody's going to go to heaven is if they made a decision about Jesus Christ before they died. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I'll tell you this and I'll leave it alone. Some of you guys, I know I tell some of these stories, you've heard some of them before, but some of you haven't. I was asked to, there was a woman who came into our store one time. She was in the women's section, uh, which you probably know where that's at, with tall dresses, I still remember it. My husband came and said, I was just talking to him, the woman's from Norway, and he said she's battling cancer. So. When they told me she had cancer, I said, can I pray for you? So I prayed for her. And you know, she didn't have anything for five years. She went into remission. What touched her the most is that this business guy would pray for her while he was at work. You know, it's not a church. It's a time and a place. Man, he's always down praying. But anyway, after five years, it, it came back. And she sent him to me and said, would you please ask him to come to see me? And would he do my funeral? I said, well, I want to talk to her. So I go over to say, 
beautiful lady, sweet lady that was raised in Norway. Her mother and father loved Jesus desperately. They had five children. Mom and dad, every night, she said, knelt at their bed, read their Bibles together, and prayed for all the kids. But not one of the kids gave their lives to Jesus. Not one of them. So here's Sigrid, dying. And so I talked to her. I said, Sigrid, would you like to see your parents again? Would you like to meet Jesus? Oh, she said, you don't know. It's too late for me. You don't know everything I've done. So I told her the story of the Apostle Paul, who once was Saul of Tarsus, who was responsible for killing, having people killed because of their faith in Jesus. I told her the story of the sinner on the cross who deserved hell, just like the guy on the other side, because he was a criminal, who called out to Jesus after the one guy was making fun of Jesus. The, the, this man said, don't you fear God? This man's done nothing wrong. We're being crucified and punished justly. He's done nothing wrong. He looked over at Jesus. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him through the pain, hard to breathe. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So I told her that story. And when she heard that, she said, yes, I want to know Jesus. So I had the privilege to lead her to Jesus. The next day I came over to see her. I was in the front room and I could hear her saying, is that Pastor Steve? Is that Pastor Steve? Have him come in here. So I mean, I just walked in the door. So when I went in to see her, she said, you're never going to believe what happened. I said, yes, I will. <laughs> they always tell me I'm not going to believe it. She said, last night, I saw my mom and dad. She said, they were saying, you're going to be with us now. You're going to be with us now. Isn't that amazing? There's another time it happened. The second story is very similar. Some family called me. This is, I had only done one funeral. I didn't do funerals. I, didn't, I always said, I don't do weddings. I don't do funerals. <laughs> what did I know? <laughs> Never tell God what you do and you don't do. <laughs> so this guy was a real rounder. I said, well, they said he's dying of pancreas cancer. Would you please do his funeral? I said, is he saved? They said, we're not sure. Now, they were best friends with this guy for 25 years. How do you as a Christian not know if your best friends are saved or not saved? I didn't say that, but probably insinuated it in the tone of my voice. I said, somebody needs to talk to him about Jesus. So for three weeks, I just prayed. Morning and night, prayed that somebody would send somebody across this man's path. That God would send somebody across this man's path. So finally, after three weeks, I had a call. He wants to talk to you. And I knew him. He used to come and stroke us down at the car dealership. So I go in the room, and there he is. He's sick. He's dying of the same thing that killed my father. And I said, Brother, I've come to tell you that I have good news for you. That Jesus died for, for your sins, and, and that you can go be with him in heaven. You know what he said? Oh, you don't know all the things I've done. Here we go again. <laughs> I thank God for Saul of Tarsus and the sinner on the cross because I've used it many times. I told him the same story as I told the woman. Actually, I did this before. What I did not know is his daughter and granddaughter, who both loved Jesus, died the previous year in a car accident. So he accepted Jesus. He the peace. I said, right now, after he prayed, I said, there's angels in this room with us right now ready to take you to be with Jesus. So the next day I came back, his wife met me at the door. This is an unchurched family. They have nothing to do with the Lord. That was one of the most interesting funerals I've ever done. It's powerful. Though. But anyway, his wife said, this morning when I went to see him, he said, Sandy, this morning, or last night, I don't know what, I saw our daughter and granddaughter saying, you're going to be with us now. Same thing. Guys, it's real. It's real. This is not some way to... Christianity is not some way just to make life easy when you're here. Well, I'll just believe this and some of my love's going to be... No, no, no. Christianity is life, eternal life, and it's real. And everything in the Bible, you can take it, take it for truth. There are over 3,000 promises in the Bible. The Bible says all God's promises are yes and amen, and amen to those who believe it. So eternal life is mine. I have it. Some of you have it. Some of you don't. But you can today. Regardless of what you ever did. You could be a murderer. You could be, you know, to God, sin is sin. But if you come to Christ and you say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God will forgive you of your sins. 
And He will make you right with God. And then your, your destiny, your reservation will be changed from hotel hell to the kingdom of heaven. It's just like that. It's by faith. It's by faith. Is there anyone in this room who you know where your destination is and it is not heaven?